at the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing excepting old crows is the street of the lifted Lorax. As absurd as it might be to start a TEDx talk on the future of truth with the Dr. Seuss poem, um, very much of my identity is tied to my relationship with poems that started in high school. Um, in the earlier part of my life, I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, with an American dad and a Taiwanese mom. And I inherited both the Southern accent and her inability to differentiate between L's, W's, and R's. So I spoke, spoke this wonderful mixture of, uh, of Southern Chinglish. <laughs> Uh, and then we moved to Florida, which is further south, but not in the south. Uh, but in starting high school, that linguistic identifier uh, labeled me as an outsider, as an other. Um, and along with that, all the ridicule that you could expect from an unathletic boy who talked differently. And when I had the, uh, the opportunity to pick my art elective, um, I chose a speech and debate class. I figured if I can't self-defend, I need to be able to uh, talk my way out of things. And so as my means of being able to uh, get extra credit, I started joining these tournaments. But since there was plenty of debating at home, I didn't join the debate side of the events. I joined uh, the literature performance-based events. So believe it or not, for four years, twice a month, I would go around Florida performing poems for competition. There would be 70, 100 kids performing different poems, sometimes memorized, sometimes with the script book. Um, and we would, would pick our own pieces. And The Lorax was one of my first poems that I had performed. And in freshman year, I still remember in one of the elimination rounds at Florida Novice States, I see a judge really laughing at my poem. And in the background, and I'm like, OK, this is great. And then later, I get back the ballot. And she said, I, I was laughing because I just couldn't get over hearing about the war acts. And it was one of those moments where I knew if this was the thing that I was going to commit to, that was feedback in order to continue uh, and to, to work on the way that I talked uh, and to use poetry as the vehicle uh, to make my life better. Um, later, I learned when you usually start in these sorts of competitions, you pick rhyming sorts of uh, you know, poems that rhyme. When we think about poetry, that's the first thing we go to. Uh, and with that, um, there's a certain limiting factor, but how do you then switch over to free verse poems? And this is where, folk, this is where we lose a lot of people, uh, us poetry enthusiasts. Song lyrics and things that rhyme are things that um, everyone can get behind for the most part. But once you get into this free verse stuff, it makes folks uncomfortable. There's usually some sort of confrontation or some puzzle to unlock. And folks get really agitated. They don't want to work that hard, perhaps, uh, with their literature. Um, one great example that I use is that when, uh, when you're trying to differentiate between prose and poetry, you know it's a poem because it's not prose. <laughs> right? And maybe if you read an author that writes in both genres, you're able to see a little bit of those differences. And one of my favorite examples is Stephen Crane, uh, very much known for his uh, uh, historic war novel, The Red Badge of Courage. And Crane died before the age of 30. Um, and all of his uh, major works of poetry came out uh, posthumously. So 1890s or so, uh, a lot of these were, were written. And this is one of my favorite ones uh, from him that I encountered in, um, in uh, high school literature classes. I saw a man pursuing the horizon. Round and round they sped. I was disturbed at this. I accosted the man. It is futile, I said. You can never, you lie, he cried, and ran on. In eight short lines, we have someone willing to confront a complete stranger. That interaction, the dismissal of the confronter. And usually in, in literature, we as the reader identify with the person saying I. But yet I think for most of you in the audience, it's the person running away. It's the person who only yells, you lie. And that's the one that we're cheering for in this particular poem. In another short one, uh, there's some lessons you can learn as well, perhaps, that some things never change. Think as I think, said a man. 
or you were abominably wicked. You are a toad. And after I had thought of it, I said, I will then be a toad. The beautiful thing in here is that perhaps this is completely unspoken. There was a clear confrontation in the first one, but maybe this was just a side glance. Maybe one part was spoken and one unspoken. Right? So I started looking at longer pieces. These are tough to perform because you know, I really stretched that one out. But, the, you know, but when you're thinking about the competition demanded it's individual poems or series of poems for eight to 10 minutes, I started diving into more and more free verse. Um, and there was a point where I started getting a little bit better at this stuff. Um, I wasn't critiqued anymore um, with, my, with my W's and L's. Um, you know, one thing I should mention, I, I would scan poems and consciously pick ones that if I would stumble on a certain word, I would eliminate it altogether. Um, the most terrifying word for me is the word rollerblade. I, I will consciously not pick words with R's and L's in them um, because that, that part still comes back for me, that stumbling block. Um, I had an arch rival named Katura. She uh, was at a high school two hours north of me. Um, and we would see each other at these competitions and we would give each other all types of encouragement and shade at the same time. Um, <laughs> for four years, Katura was pretty much unbeatable. You know, and that, there was something so admirable about her energy. She could read a cereal box and, and jazz would come out of her mouth. And, and everyone would just hand her a trophy and no one would mind, <laughs> right? And, and Gatura ended up being that, that frenemy, that person that, you know, everyone would just hope to be in the final round with her. Um, and there was a point where, you know, she said, so, uh, you know, Frap, like, you know, your stuff's great, you're in, you're in these rounds with me, but you're so uptight. You're so uptight. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm performing serious poems. They're, they're meant to be a little bit serious. And she said, that's not what I'm talking about. This isn't about you. This is about the words. And you can perform serious things without being uptight. And that, that was just one of those, you know, uh, can I sit with you all day moments. And tied to one particular tournament, my mom gave me the mandate, if you don't come home with a bigger trophy, you've got to let this go. We don't even know what you're doing with this literature stuff. Um, it's taking time away on weekends. You've never studied for an SAT. Your grades are not high enough A's. Um, and you've got to stop. So come home with a bigger trophy and, and prove that you really want to do this. So in front of one particular tournament, I told Katura this. And she said, OK, I have an idea. Come on. You've heard, you've heard me perform so many times. You know my piece. I know yours. And just, just give, me, give me the beginning of one of my poems that I do. And I'm like, Katura, at this particular part of the year, she was performing slam poetry from an anthology of Puerto Rican New York uh, coffee shop artists, right? <laughs> Like me, like I was gonna do that, and she said, "Come on!" And we're in the middle of a hotel, you know, busy area, hundreds of, you know, you can imagine the type of kid going around and and doing all these things. She's like, "Come on, bring it!" And I'm like, "I'm not doing this." And in one point, she insisted, and I just clenched my hands and I just said, it, it, "It's getting, it's getting, it's getting kind of hectic." And then the 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 everyone stopped <laughs> in the middle of the hallway. They knew something happened. And I felt within me something happened. There was this whole other thing that unlocked inside of me. And prior to this tournament where I got a mandate, do better or quit, for the thing that I got the most sense of identity from, I knew I had to bring it. And there was one particular poem that I still rely on and just think about, like that, mo that what if moment if I didn't, you know, didn't do well enough. Uh, and an American poet, W.S. Merwin, uh, writes a lot of free verse poems, poems that really seem like prose. Um, and this is really obscure, but one of his poems, he adapted a folk legend from a Guarani Indian tribe in South America on good versus evil. Um, and the beginning of, of, of the poem, uh, I'll share with you from The Stranger. One day in the forest, there was somebody who had never been there before. It was somebody like the monkeys, but taller, and without a tail and without so much hair, standing up and walking on only two feet. And as he went, he heard a voice calling, save me. 
Then there's this whole physical thing of man fighting with the devil in the form of a snake. I get all into it, you know? So, but at the end of that, I always remember, it was being able to tap into that sort of energy, the good versus evil in, in a free verse form. Um, and I have to thank Keturah for that. Um, because that was the one tournament <laughs> at which I placed a little bit higher than she did. Um, uh, later on, senior year of high school, we start learning about Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. And we had to memorize the first uh, 12 lines of the prologue of the Canterbury Tales. And we had to perform it in front of our peers. And this was such a drag for so many of us. And of course, I was the excited one, but couldn't get too excited about it. Um, and the and the thing about this part that I'm going to share with you is that it has become over time this wonderful mixture with Chaucer writing in the late 1390s, right on, you know, the late 1300s around that time. It's that mixture of familiar and unfamiliar English, which very much sounded like the English in many ways, the, the fragmented sense of it um, that I felt that I had grown up with. Word sounds and words that were familiar, things that I constantly had to decode. And, and then going back to rhyming poetry, w the way that Chaucer wrote it was meant to be rhythmical with a sense of breath. And as I go through these lines, you can inhale and exhale along with it. The I am and the metric with it, um, uh, you might be able to follow along if you catch it here. And the other part of it is that um, Chaucer sets the setting. So even though the words and sounds might be unfamiliar, he sets a time and place for it that uh, in, in springtime and in the middle of April, even as specific as we're halfway through the astrological sign of Aries, the weather is so beautiful that the, uh, that the animals stay up all night to enjoy it as well. And it's so inspiring that we go into uh, it, um, uh, celebrating nature, and it inspires people to go on a pilgrimage, which is the whole point um, of the Canterbury Tales. And to inhale and exhale here, one then April with the shore of Sota, the drop of March hath pierced to the rota and bathed every vein in sweet liqueur, in which vertu engendered is the floor. One zephyrus ache with his sweet of breath, in spirit hath in every holt and heth, the tender croppers and the younger son hath in the path as have a course he run. And small the fowl is mac and melody let slep in all the nicht with open e. So pricketh him the tour and hear courages than a longing folk to go on pilgrimages. Later, in, I immediately took this poem as my personal time out. <laughs> As a very frustrated and frustratable person, I'm like, if I can just delay 35 seconds, how do I do that before I react to something? And I can't tell you how many times I've played this excerpt in my head. Um, it's become also my, from Forrest Gump, my Jenny, dear God, make me a bird moment as well, to be able to then channel, channel something greater um, to make sense of a confusing time. Um, this became particularly handy uh, in January this year. Uh, I work as a college counselor, as an academic advisor, in preparing students to go to college. Um, it's the only career I've had for 18 years, a thing that I see myself doing forever. Um, and one of the battles that we always face is that battle of students that want to study humanities uh, but don't really know where to go from there. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is, with all this push for technology and so forth, 40 and 45% of the most selective schools in the country still reserve slots that proportion for humanities and social science majors. Uh, it's not that technology is taking over universities, it's just that much more selective for those wishing to major in technology and engineering and so forth. But the humanities are not going away from the colleges, but perhaps among high schools. And so that's something that I reflect on. And the conference I was going to in January was studying and a lot of discussions on belonging and diversity within high schools and colleges. Uh, and so I go and get my bag. I'm ready to go off to this conference. And then a man starts firing at the carousel, a man who wasn't even on our flight, um, who, for whatever reason, decided to pick our carousel and start shooting people. And when it became clear that there was a that there was a, uh, a, a, this was a true situation, and in seeing people go down, I drop into a, a yoga chaturanga pose and quietly put a hand over my head and take a gigantic breath. 
And in my mind, if I can wait 35 seconds, this will be over. And I figured it would take about that long because in airports nowadays, we're very much accustomed to seeing armed security. Um, and especially, I've compared this, I traveled on one of the very few flights in the country on September 13th, 2001. For whatever reason, I caught the only flight out of St. Louis with seven people on it, and it went to Jacksonville. Why that route, and why was I on that plane to go recruit students uh, in high schools in North Florida? I'm still chewing on that. But what we haven't realized post 9-11 is that we are, are, we are not startled when we don't see armed security in the airport. So we're accustomed to seeing them, but we're not startled when we don't. And I figured someone's gonna take this guy down. And then they didn't. And so as I was just holding my breath, speed racing through this to try to stay as still as possible, uh, two things went off in front of me. One bullet went off above my head uh, and shrapnel embedded itself into my hand. The only time I looked up was to see if I still had that hand. And then the next thing that I knew, there was a, a luggage that fell on top of me. I heard a thump. Uh, and then I get up and walk away. I was wearing my backpack. It was only later that that thump was another stray bullet that had hit the wall and entered my backpack and embedded, it, embedded itself into my laptop. The, and I have the privilege of being able to walk away from that, but also with this word cloud now. And I believe we all have this word cloud. We all have this mixture of things that we carry with us. We're all the manifestations of our life experiences. And then the timing of that too, where I was able to process this is one week prior, Carrie Fisher passed away. And this was all over the internet at the same time, even Meryl Streep's um, uh, award speech at the Golden Globes. And perhaps this is what I should be doing being able to endorse this within myself and perhaps within others. I feel as well that the media paid so much attention to the material things in that moment. The laptop with the bullet hole. I happen to have a, a backpack with bulletproof lining. What's the coincidence of that? But folks also have never inquired that there was something immaterial that got me through that moment as well. It's that combination. It wasn't just the stuff around me, uh, but the fact that I was able to stay still uh, with, a, with a technique um, that I very much credit learning uh, in my high school classes. Um, and so I think the future of truth, we have to think about the immaterial uh, and material things in front of us. And sometimes there's a signal from the universe about what you should do with it as well. One of my friends made this meme <laughs> and put it out there. And well, I, I think it's, it's, it's pitching at a level that I'm unable to uh, live up to I do think that my future of truth is very much thinking about words first, technology second, and, and how to work and, and serve those in front of me. Thank you very much.